Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman trying a moon launch from the Big Island. And trust me, I think NASA has nothing on us. We're on our second computer and, and are probably our fourth try on uh, linking things up. So uh, my apologies for getting a late start here, but uh, we have a great guest today uh, who's been traveling a lot lately, and uh, we just reconnected with him, but it's uh, Councilman Tim Richards from the Big Island. And uh, he's been pretty active here with renewable energy and renewable energy projects uh, on the Big Island. And I can tell you as a resident uh, half Wayne Island, that the Big Island of Hawaii is probably ahead of the rest of the state and maybe even the rest of the nation on um, renewable energy and really establishing it here in the state of Hawaii. So Councilman Richards, I'm, I'm really happy you could join us and I appreciate your patience while we try to put all this together. Well, thanks, Stan. I appreciate the invite for sitting in on this. Um, this is a new one for me. I guess it's a streaming podcast or whatever it's called. So anyway, all good. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, it's been a tough road for us. Paul and I have been down to Kau already this morning. So as you know, that's a, that's a long drive from uh, where we're at in, uh, up near Puvava. And uh, we just visited the uh, farm, the co coffee farm down there that has a hydroelectric plant they're trying to hook up. Uh -huh. And so it was really exciting to see that technology because as you know, that's another great renewable resource that we have here on the Big Island in our in our hip pocket for a generation of electricity. A little bit um, and the kind of things that the, the County of Hawaii is doing to move forward in renewable energy. Um, a little bit of that cut out, but I, I think you're asking about what we're trying to do for renewable energy going forward in our county. Um, our big, the Big Island, one of the great things about the Big Island is they have quite the portfolio of potential for renewable energy sources. We have wind, we have photovoltaic, we have <clears throat> hydroelectric, and we have geothermal. And promoting good policy that, that potentially can tap into all those is what I'm trying to do. Currently, I am sitting chair for agriculture, water, energy, environmental management, and truly agriculture blend together because, again, the environment is all of that. And what we're looking for is how we can employ and embrace some of these renewable sources that we have to go forward. One of the most current initiatives that we have uh, is working on bringing forth the zero emission buses, both electric and fuel cell buses. And that has been in the work now for about you know, six or eight months. Uh, I am hopeful that we'll be on on island and up and running in about the next 60 to 90 days. Yeah, I think that's realistic. I just talked to Mitch, uh, actually the guy that runs the station at Nelha, and he said that mm -hmm. all they have back from bringing the buses over is to get the, the fire system checked by the inspectors and then they're cleared to, to start refueling at the station and that's the key to bring the buses over. So um, I think you're right on that they're almost here. Yeah, I, I think you're right on that one too, Stan. I know, um, I believe where you're visiting, you were talking about that hydroelectric down in Kau. That goes back to when I was sitting on our Agriculture Advisory Commission and they were just trying to implement and employ that um, hydroelectric plant. I want to say it was a 400 kilowatt. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes. Um, and uh, again, that is a substantial generation potential for that resource down there. And whether or not it could be used as part of a um, energy source for the Kau district, and also possibly as an energy source for, again, generating hydrogen on that side of the island. There's, there's a lot of good things before us. We just have to figure out how to put them all together. Yeah, you know, and another great source here on the Big Island that's uh, that's kind of got me uh, excited on one hand and, and worried on the other hand is geothermal. You know, ever since uh, Puna Geothermal uh, stopped production um, for the volcano, I think it got everybody's attention that how critical that resource was and how much it was actually depended on by the electric company. Yeah, I don't do disagree. Go ahead. Oh, I want that question there. Try again, Stan. Oh, um, so in the future, do you see geothermal as a as a really good, strong candidate here on the Big Island for generating uh, renewable power? 
Absolutely. Um, as I understand, it was one of our least expensive costs of energy going forward. And I know some of the old technology, and I think that technology has got to be 20 plus years old of what they were doing. The technology is quite a bit. And with that, the high temperatures that were needed before, we don't need near temperatures that high. And so um, what was thought of 25 years ago, it's a very different duck today. The ability to generate energy with far less heat is there, and we just have to embrace the new technologies. Does, does that give the big island more in terms of not having directly over a particularly hot spot to be able to do geothermal um, in different locations that may not be as culturally sensitive or um, populated and, and would allow themselves to be more suited to an industrial complex like a geothermal complex? I, I'm not the, the engineer to answer that, but the long story short, that's how I understand it. And we don't have to have as high as temperatures. Um, the Big Island, by definition, we're a volcanic, we're a volcanic mass. And we know that the temperatures underneath us are warm. So if we can get and harvest some of that energy at a much lower temperature, I think that really opens up the door for a lot of energy generation potential, which would translate into lower costs for us. I, I think that's that'd be great. I, I know that a University of Hawaii study done back in the 70s actually shows that Maui and Oahu have geothermal potential. And when you, as you mentioned, now with the new technology not needing as much heat, there's even a possibility that Oahu can generate its own geothermal if it's done properly. Um, I, it would make sense because we're all volcanic origin, uh, but we know we are over the hot spot and Loihi coming up is the hot spot. So, um, but yeah, if we can use <clears throat> less heat to generate that energy, all the better and better for. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, Paul and I were at a, at a uh, seminar earlier, a symposium earlier uh, or later last week, and uh, it was an OTEC uh, symposium. And you mentioned Lo'i'i. For those of you that aren't aware, that's the next island coming up in the next 10 or 12,000 years. It's uh, off the south coast of the Big Island, and it's still underwater, but it's generating an awful lot of heat. It'd be interesting to look at ocean thermal associated with on one side and hot water from Lohihi to start generating electricity. That might actually be an interesting experiment for the university. Okay, Stan, you got me thinking. Yeah, um, that is an interesting question. And I think what we've got to do is we've got to keep our minds open in exploring all the potential possibilities ahead of us. And that is a very interesting We have to think on that one. Okay. Well, you've been on, on the Big Island for quite a few years, and I'm, I'm, I've am I'm been here a lot, but I, I don't really know the terrain that well. I know that Richard Ha has a, a hydroelectric plant, and I just saw one in Kau this morning. What's the potential for more hydroelectric off of the old sugar flumes and things that we already have in place that we maybe aren't utilizing enough? I think um, the potential ahead of us is vast. Uh, a concept I've been working on for probably at least the last 12 or 14 years, but realistically probably 15 or 18 years, is a pump storage hydro initiative um, out of the Kohala Mountains. And the Kohala Mountains have a unique geography that lends itself to a pump storage hydro initiative. Our people out viewing that to understand pump storage hydro, what we do is we use water at a high level and run it downhill to a lower level, generating electricity through a, a hydro um, generation plant. During the off-peak season, we use another source of renewable energy, and in this case, it would be wind turbines, to pump the water back uphill and store that energy potential back up at a higher elevation. Kohala Mountain has a unique geography and climate that's very conducive to that. We dropped from an elevation of about 4,500 feet elevation down to sea level in about seven miles. So we have a substantial grade. We have a rainfall pattern at the top of the mountain of some areas in excess of 140 inches of rain a year. And we have a wind pattern that is exceptional that can generate a lot of power. So 
in the day, you run the, the water downhill generating power and using the wind turbines to generate power. At night, you use the wind turbines to pump the water back uphill when the demand for power is low. In addition to that, and this is where the night part comes in, we can use the water there for irrigation to expand our agricultural potential. Energy out of the system could then be used also for, I'm gonna use the term value added, maybe used for cold storage and maybe use it for processing vegetables and or meats. Uh, I put the whole thing together so we start harvesting the synergy between the agriculture side and the energy side and putting it together. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is find a more self-reliant production of our food and of our energy. So I, and one of the big benefits is there is some of the old infrastructure in the mountains still left that we may be able to harvest. Yeah, and, and at our visit to the coffee farm this morning, we were talking about agricultural censored, uh, centered um, use of hydrogen. And I reminded the folks that when you make hydrogen, you're not far from making ammonia for fertilizers. And that could be a big plus as you make hydrogen, you could start making your own fertilizer using nitrogen from the air and hydrogen to make your fertilizers. And then you have byproducts like pure oxygen that could go into aquaponics and help you accelerate the growth of your fish on, on fish farms. And you know, the, the connections keep going on and on. Um, you, you just be amazed once you start getting into the industrial uses of hydrogen, including Helco itself that uses hydrogen for cooling its gas turbines at its power production plant that are, that's running now on, on fossil fuel. There's, there's an incredible number of uses for hydrogen that I think once we get into that economy, we'll, we'll start finding gains all over the place, especially in agriculture, uh, for the use of hydrogen. I, and I think, Stan, that's where we need to go. We need to be open-minded and we need to look for the synergies that are between all these different um, potential sources of energy and or products that come out of that. And I completely agree with you on that. We've got to look for those relationships. And we import something like 90 plus percent of our food, our island daily, about a million pounds of food just to take care of our island itself. We know the, the demand is there, people want to eat. We know we have the capability of production. We have 4,000 square miles. We have a very large county. We have water resources. We have renewable energy potential. And so what we need to do is we've got to put that together and come up with something that, again, long term, I think we'll start solving some of our problems. Yeah, we were just talking about on the way down down the hill today. They don't call it the Big Island for nothing. You got more square <laughs> foot, more acreage, and more uh, square miles of farm productive farmland and uh, timberland and everything. Uh, you've got the natural resources, and and that brings us to a point that you know, as an Oahu raised boy, um, I can tell you that Hiko's plans to go uh, renewable by 2045 with their resources is a no go. They're not going to be able to do it. They're going to depend on the neighbor islands for importing energy. And I look to hydrogen as the way to export big island energy to the other islands, especially Oahu, to meet our 100% goals. Because the big island is going to have no trouble meeting a renewable goal by 2045. It's Oahu that's going to have the problem. And so um, how, do, how do you think the big island folks would feel if they were producing the energy and selling it to Oahu? Um, and then helping get our state off of the uh, big bill of exporting our money to fossil to purchase fossil fuel. You know, um, these are some old numbers, Stan, and, and I'm going to have to um, go back and update these. But I think at one point we were sending spending over five billion dollars in fossil fuel for fossil fuel um, to generate predominantly most of our energy sources. And I agree with you. I think Big Island is well ahead of the rest of the state. We have we have so much here as capability. Um, I wanna say we're somewhere around 45% um, renewable potential at this point. So I think the 2045 is very, very attainable. Now generation for the rest of the state, we're gonna have all sides of the argument. I got that. One of the things that I look at sitting in the council seat is that I want to look at not only what we can generate, but the economy that'll generate, and thereby the jobs that it'll generate, and thereby how we're going to support ourselves. And so, if we can create an energy future for us 
as an energy um, potential exporter, potential economy that'll supply jobs for people, supply an economy that'll take care of the big island. So for me, it's exciting. Well, you know, one of the things that we talked about this morning as we were discussing, uh, you know, future potential for the big island was the, to the subject of permitting. And I can tell you that on the island of Oahu, and I I've lived there for fi over 50 years, that, and I used to do construction where I could walk into the building department or walk in with a plan and walk out with a permit. And those days are long gone. You know, now there, there are so many uh, regulatory and so many agencies involved in permitting that aren't even co-located. You know, how are we going to attack that county and state and federal problem and start streamlining for new businesses and new technology to get their permitting done at a reasonable pace? Um, I mean, I don't expect it instantaneously, but in the day of computers, we've gone from, uh, you know, one day's permitting to one year. And it seems to be going the wrong way with all the technology we have in computers and instant connections. You know, how, how do you recommend that we get past the permitting stumblings that we have? Well, um, first of all, I completely agree with you uh, in the fact that it takes way too long to get our permitting going forward. And I think probably part of that is a misunderstanding. I, we would believe that with all our computer technology, that everything is linked. But what we're coming to find is, unfortunately, that's not the case. And things aren't linked. And we've moved an agenda forward of safety in the name of public safety that we're trying to um, regulate and be sure that everything is as safe as possible. Well, that does come with a cost. And unfortunately, it has to go through so many different regulatory branches to be reviewed that slows down the process tremendously. And then the fact that we don't have these processes actually linked through our uh, potential of, again, like you said, the computers and all. So I think what we have to do is have to start working on that. And I get very frustrated sitting in um, county council because we are glacial in trying to get some of this stuff done. And we have to pick it up. I know there are people on our council working on trying to streamline our permitting process, but that's not a near fix. That's going to take some time because we're trying to put the the different departments together so we can streamline this stuff and right now it's just not happening yeah i, I think you're right but I, I i can tell you right now it's not just a county problem when you look at the state office of historic preservation one thing i've run into on the on oahu doing military projects is they only have one or two guys in that office but they have to review every stinking uh, new construction that that goes on and even some uh, remodeling construction and they're just overwhelmed but you try and hire the guys that are qualified to do that and they're not available so i mean how do we how do we solve those without at least amending the criteria or simplifying the criteria so that maybe a, a lesser qualified person can screen and get rid of the ones we really need to look at and not have to go through these big long drawn out processes in undermanned shops I can't attend or I can't make a comment on the state and I know Shifty is a problem, the historical preservation, because that is a bottleneck and we run in, into the same problems here in the county. From the county perspective, I do know that planning and building are trying to figure out how, if they can detail part of the review process to a lower level, again, to streamline and so we can get that coming forward in a faster click because as our our population grows here, thus we have more potential requests for these services. We're gonna to have to address it, whether it means more manpower or streamlining the um, acceptance process. Probably both of those actually make this thing work, but it is a huge obstruction to moving things forward. And we all recognize okay. that. Okay, can I make a suggestion yeah. from for the county? As, as, a former employee, as a former employee in DBED, um, I tried encouraging DBED as the business development people to, to help solve this problem, both at the local, state, and federal level. But be, and they, their response to me was, well, we're not a permitting organization, so it's not our Kuliana. And my response is the counties might want to push back and say, Yes, it is. You're the people who ought to be coordinating the state, local, and federal agencies 
on this permitting. So should we put together some kind of task force at the state level to help new technologies? I mean, our, our state's future ec economy revolves around new technology and, and like you say, diversifying our agriculture and things like that. How are we going to get ahead of this permitting debacle if we don't get a task force or something together to focus on the root cause? I, I think having a, uh, some sort of working group is probably in part the answer. I won't say the whole answer, but adapting or adapting and adopting a new technology usually politicians and um, departments a little bit off because it's going to be new and it's going to be groundbreaking. And so I think part of that is getting together. You put the right people in the room that can answer all the questions. And so we're not starting fresh, fresh, fresh when someone's reviewing something, that there's actually a lot of answers that have already been given. So there's a level of comfort to take that forward. Because unless we have the people that can answer all the questions at the table up front, I think that's where we run into a lot of obstruction. And I, I get it. I understand people don't want to jump and change things real quickly. But by the same token, I agree with you. Our future is in our technology. We have to embrace the technology. Our society needs energy. We also want to have a renewable energy source that is very environmentally friendly. We're going to be adopting new technologies. We have to. And we need the help to adopt those. Well, I tell you what, Councilman, we've got about two minutes left, and I'd like to leave that last two minutes to you to just kind of give us your your perspective on what you plan to do for the big economy um, to help um, move new clean energy solutions forward and, and help with new technology. Well, thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. I do appreciate the conversation. Um, my initiatives, my agenda, however I uh, phrase them are quite simple. I see the interaction potential for us as a county and realistically as a state because a lot of things that I work on, I want to be sure that we're keeping in mind that they could be replicable and we do them in other places in our state. This whole agriculture, water, energy, um, I give a talk on that, agriculture, water, energy, a food nexus. The idea there is that we're blending all these initiatives coming forward. And like I said, I've been working on this pump storage hydro with irrigation for the last, let's say, dozen years. My intent is to move that forward. What happens out of that is, again, we create that economy. It's going to demand higher technical skill to operate this stuff. Plus, we will source water out of the reservoirs for this to, again, encourage and expand our agricultural production. We have the demand for food in our state. Like I said, million pounds a day on this island alone. Statewide, we need over 7 million pounds of food a day. The market is here. The question is, can we produce it economically? I want to march forward. And I think we can get it. I believe that the desire from the public as well as the political climate is right to push this agenda forward so we can have the agriculture production while we are working our energy and specifically the renewable energies. Our economy, the GDP of our economy right now, about 1% comes out of agriculture, not quite. That is on par with our national production. About 1% of our GDP actually comes out of agriculture. Hawaii's agriculture is actually doing pretty well, but it needs help and more stewarding. And with that will come the self-reliance, the overall sustainable model that we're all striving for. So sitting in this council chair, I agreed to, to run for office, agriculture approach to work on good policy coming forward. And that's what I'm gonna keep doing. Well, thanks, uh, Councilman Richards. And I really appreciate you helping out with our technological challenges on our own show today. And uh, thanks to Paul Pontio and Robert back in the studio for helping pull this all together in, in spite of uh, my analog brain in the digital world. Uh, so thanks to both uh, Robert, uh, Paul, and to uh, Councilman Tim Richards from the Big Island for today's show. And Stan Osterman signing off until next week, Tuesday. Aloha.